Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki, and this is session number one of a new program we're starting here at the Rich Dad Company. It's, it's to promote my latest book, The Capitalist Manifesto. And it's a brand new book. You can see it on the screen here. You know, look for it in local bookstores or order it online. So this is session number one of Capitalist Manifesto. And as a very dear old friend, he's a young guy, but he's an old friend. And he's going to tell us what it's like to be inside a country that collapses. And his name is Philip Haslin. His book is When Money Destroys Nations. You can see it here. Please get the book. It's eye-opening. Because as you know, as we talk today, America is just cranking out the money. They're just printing, 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 printing. People are now waiting for UBI, Universal Basic Income, MMT, Marxist Monetary Theory. Everybody wants free money. So what we're doing is, Philip wrote a book, When Money Destroys Nations, because he, is, he lives in South Africa, one of my favorite places on planet Earth. I came across this book, I was going through Johannesburg Airport, and I saw this book, When Money Destroys Nations. I went, I, I just had to read it. And so Philip was, you know, this young guy, he crossed over from South Africa into Zimbabwe to study what happened when Zimbabwe collapsed. And Zimbabwe collapsed for many reasons, but one of them is they started doing what the U.S. is doing today. They're printing money to pay their bills. So it's a very important time. So I wanted to invite Philip Haslin. He's our first guest when money destroys nations because it's important we understand what happened in Zimbabwe. You know, Zimbabwe is kind of a laughing star right now because the Zimbabwe dollar is worth more today than it was when they were printing it. It's... It's, it's more, it's used today as a tourist item. It's a souvenir. It's a joke. It's no different than what Hitler did in, well not Hitler, but the Weimar Republic did in Germany in 1920. And America's doing today. It's no different than what Mugab, or when, what they did in Venezuela or, or uh, yeah, Venezuela or Argentina. We're doing the same thing. So that's why the, my book is called Capitalist Manifesto. It's why I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's because we have no financial education in schools, and most people have no idea what's happening right now. The United States is going socialist, Marxist, possibly communist. That's what frightens me. And I know I can probably get a deep platform for this, but so be it. So with that, I want to invite my friend here, Philip Haslin, When Money Destroys Nations. Welcome to the program, Philip. Good afternoon, Robert, and good afternoon to your viewers. Right, and so where are you right now? I'm in Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm uh, right. nine hours behind you. But so would you tell us a little bit your background and what caused you to write the book When Money Destroys Nations? Wonderful, thanks Robert. Um, so, so this is the book When Money Destroys Nations. And um, I've been passionate for the last uh, 25 years since I, since I was at university about the issue of money printing. And um, I studied uh, uh, economics and finance at the uh, University of Cape Town. I was very concerned at the time they were uh, advocating in our lectures that uh, money printing was a very good thing. At university, they were saying it was a good thing. Yes. In fact, you yeah. can't go to a university around the world where they don't, uh, where the majority of your economics uh, is, uh, is, is focused around debt and money printing. Um, but I was exposed to, to uh, um, the Austrian school at that stage. And, uh, you know, I've, I started to engage with the, the issue of, of money printing and, and developed a course and was going around um, uh, teaching people about uh, money printing. This was um, uh, just before 2008 uh, financial crisis and then during the, the 2008 financial crisis. And, um, and uh, you know, during one of those uh, talks, uh, my my current co-author Russell Lamberti said to uh, said to us in 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 the, in the talk he was uh, presenting with me, he said, you know, we've got an example of what happens when a country prints money on a large scale right next door to us, and I'm telling you that there are stories there that people haven't heard. And um, I thought that was very fascinating, and I I went to interview a bunch of my Zimbabwean friends. And um, uh, 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 the country Zimbabwe had uh, had uh, collapsed in in hyperinflation, and um, and their stories fascinated me. And I, I, I you know I, I lay awake at night thinking this is crazy. 
crazy that ordinary people lived through this and and I've actually never heard their story. I ended up traveling to uh, Zimbabwe and, and traveling around the, uh, the various cities and interviewing people, just asking them, you know, tell me about what happened in the hyperinflation. How did money printing affect you personally? And, and, um, and, you know, you know very, many of the people started saying, you know, I actually can't really remember it. I kind of blocked it out. It was, you know, it was quite bad. But then I'd ask them stories like, you know, what happened when the stores emptied? What happened when, when uh, you couldn't get any fuel? Or when, when the uh, water um, uh, pumps dried up? Uh, you know, how did you respond? And then their stories came and they spoke from their heart. I typically, you know, would meet with someone for two hours and I'd just be scribbling and just taking notes um, just to hear, you know, how did it affect people personally? I interviewed people from all walks of life, you know, teachers, uh, business owners, housewives, uh, you know, farmers, just across the, across the spectrum, taxi drivers, and, uh, and just hear, heard their stories. Um, and, you know, that, that initially was just a, a special interest uh, a trip for me. And that turned into a whole lot of material that, that ultimately led to, to uh, myself and my co-author, Russell Lamberti, um, writing the book, When Money Destroys Nations. Well, what's interesting is that South Africa is right next to Zimbabwe. I mean, you could technically walk to it you know, if you had to. But uh, South Africa had no idea what was going on. You know, I, I knew. Well, we knew that there was, uh, you know, there were some reports about this, you know, famine in, in Zimbabwe and, and we had a lot of people coming across the borders. We, we knew that there was, there was uh, hyperinflation. What we didn't know was how ordinary people responded. What, what actually happened in, in the social communities, how, how money printing affected the, the very fabric of the Zimbabwe society. We, we couldn't pick it up uh, um, uh, and, and you know, certainly we, we'd heard stories and there were things in the newspaper. I mean, it, it would be the same equivalent to, to say, for instance, Venezuela. You know, most people haven't got a, haven't got a clue what's actually happening in Venezuela in, 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 a, um, in, a, in an understanding of how a person is, is, is actually being affected by, by money printing in the country right now. But they probably heard many stories. Oh, yes, Venezuela is going through hyperinflation at the moment, you know, that's typically the, 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 the difference. Would you mind telling some of the stories of what happened to ordinary people when their money turned into the Zim dollar? You know, it was, it's a joke, right? You know, it's a joke. Yes. The tourist, it's a yeah, tourist yeah, thing yeah, now. It, you, it, buy, you buy Zim it's dollars. It's a bad joke, price. but for, for many people, it was a, a raw reality. I, I interviewed one lady, and she said that at university they studied the uh, uh, the German hyperinflation in the 1920s of the 1920s, and she thought, "Geez, what a bizarre scenario! You know, you got these people, you know, sweeping up notes on the street, taking uh, um, uh, you know wheelbarrows full of money to go and pay." And and she can she could even recall when she, when I was speaking to her, she could even recall the thinking wow you know how could people live like that you know what a what an interesting scenario but she then says to me she said to me I, I had no idea that in a few short years I would be living through the same thing you see the thing is it's 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 really easy to describe it it's almost sort of comical in in uh, in nature when you hear about it except that it happens quite quickly and it happens quite predictably. I mean, just to comment, you know, few people know that there have been 56 incidences of hyperinflation in the last 100 years. It happens, it's a regular event. It happens when a country begins printing money on a large scale. So, so how did it actually affect ordinary Zimbabweans? Well, the, the economic reality is that money printing caused prices to rise. And, uh, you know, that was very subtle initially, but um, as it began to, to uh, cause prices to rise su substantially, it, 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 it made people poorer. You could buy less and less and less. Um, ultimately, what, what, what happened was uh, uh, it put pressure on producers, people who produced things. Um, manufacturers, uh, the retail industry, put pressure on them, and ultimately, the the it shut down the entire manufacturing and 
uh, agricultural, uh, retail, uh, wholesaling uh, uh, markets. Um, and, and so people couldn't get any food in the stores. The only way that they could get food was to, to barter and uh, to, to you know, actually bring real value and then you know, barter behind, behind a clubhouse, as it were. I mean, many, many stories about uh, uh, clubhouses, taxi ranks, and these types of places becoming meeting places where people uh, would meet and, and, uh, and would barter for, 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 uh, for goods that they needed in day-to-day life. So, so I mean, the, the very typical thing is you, you put pressure on, on, your, on, your, on your supply chains. Money printing effectively wipes out your supply chains. Because, because, and, no, um, because nobody will sell to you. Because your Zim, the Zim dollar is worth nothing, nobody will sell you anything. So the, 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 the supermarkets go empty. They can't bring food in. Yeah, so, so what happens is you, you, you sell something and you get paid and it takes a while for you to restock your stores. And the time that you, you need to pay for those, sto- uh, those goods, the prices have, have risen and your margins, your effective margins have decreased. And then you sell and the prices have gone up, but then you need to restock your stores and the prices have increased. And a time comes when that inflation cycle starts to uh, you know, beat you at the kind of supply game and, and you actually become unprofitable. Your margins become unprofitable. You can't ra- raise your, 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 your prices fast enough to compensate for the, the cost of your inputs. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very subtle thing and it's very difficult to actually pin it down but you get a sudden moment when all the stores begin to to go empty, and um, and you know businesses begin to shut down, and 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 then it begins to put unique pressures on people. Well, how do you actually get supply? Um, uh, you know, most people, you know, even in, in in Zimbabwe in those days, most people got their food and goods and services from stores, and so it just fundamentally changed the way that. Uh, um, People interacted in a business sense, and it became about barter. And it became about you know people spend a lot of time trying to kind of understand how do I price goods so that like when I restock the stores, I can uh, I can uh, remain uh, profitable again. So that dynamic affected all of of uh, the economy. So the f- uh, fuel stations, water and f- uh, fuel reserves, government services got uh, uh, completely wiped out. You know, um, you can imagine that when 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 you're trying to pay taxes, or when the government's collecting taxes, and t- and 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 uh, you know, you typically pay taxes at the end of the year, but by that stage, all the all the tax revenue is, has been eroded. So this is a bizarre thing that the money printing that, that that funds the government ends up actually eroding the tax base of the government, and and the government gets poorer and poorer in its ability to deliver on services. So when you see like Japan. 30 years now has been printing. You see America with Biden coming in now, they're saying, oh good, inflation is coming because they print, I think, like four, another four trillion and they're gonna print another trillions. Our whole US economy is coming apart because exactly as your book says, when money destroys nations, the US dollar is destroying the world right now. You know, because it's the reserve currency of the world. So when you hear stories of Japan, what, what goes through your brain? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a few, few comments. And, and this, this comes from a, an entire worldview. It's, a, it's, a, it's ultimately my life calling. It's a message, guys, that uh, money printing actually causes real tangible pain for people. As, a, as a, an economist, Robert Virma said, uh, money from heaven will be the path to hell. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it, it it sounds so attractive that we should just print money and give it to everyone, and and ultimately the government is our, our supplier, uh, or, or, or our, our um, gives us our incomes, but but it 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 leads to specific steps that that lead a, a country into extreme economic pain. So. Um, you know, part of what we, we we've done in the book and what we've what we've been doing in our presentations is to try and depersonalize the issue of money printing, because uh, it, money printing can become quite a political thing, 
Um, and and people can point to, you know, okay, well, Joe Biden is the one that's doing all the money printing. Well, you know, actually it was, you know, there's a lot of money printing before. Let's talk about money printing in, 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 in um, you know, in, 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 in less um, uh, polarized terms. Money printing in a nutshell causes a, a country to, to become extremely poor and it causes the individuals in the country to uh, be impoverished. That, that takes time. It takes, it takes um, uh, you know, it, it never happen, you never just slip into hyperinflation in a day. It takes time. And, 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 and specifically what, what happens is the government typically loses its uh, restraint. So it starts off being, you know, we'll just print a little bit of money. And we'll use it for certain causes. And this happens everywhere. It's happened actually throughout history. We'll just print well, so, a little so, bit of money. So to inter interrupt you, in your book, man, I, I want, you're going to sell a lot of books when money destroys nations. But one of, the, one of my favorite stories from your book, is it the seven falls or the six falls of the pools or whatever it is? Because that's what you're talking about. Once you start, you can't stop, right? Hmm. Yeah. So, so we call it uh, six gorge moments. And the analogy comes from a, um, a, a river in the Hottentot Holland Mountains in, in, in the Cape, in South Africa, uh, where, where uh, there's a whole series of waterfalls. And, and um, you know, you, you can, you, 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 there's a whole lot of people that they, they go down. It's called Suicide Gorge, okay, for a reason, <laughs> because you jump off and you land in the pools below. But, but uh, and, and I've done it twice. Uh, and I don't. I won't do it again. But the the <laughs> the the, the uh, what happens is you, you know once you jump off the first waterfall, I never and, and it never occurred to me before I did that jump. Once you jump off the first waterfall, you can't go back up. <laughs> okay, it's very difficult to go back up. So you've got to go and walk along, and then you got to jump down the next waterfall, and then the next waterfall, and the next waterfall. And until, until you ultimately get to the, you know, these bigger and larger waterfalls and you're stuck because you either, you, you know, you either stay on the one level you know, and, and spend the nights there or, you, or you, you continue jumping. So that's, so that's how governments start, right? They start with the first fall. It's the first fall. It's the first little bit of money printing that happens. What actually, you know, economically and, and uh, um, socially what happens is money printing begins to lead to uh, inflation. And, uh, and that takes time. It trickles into the economy. The government prints a little bit of money and slowly prices begin to rise. But after a while, everyone in their minds socially begin to price in future uh, uh, price, uh, uh, money printing, future money printing. And a subtle shift begins to take place. And that shift is where instead of, uh, doing price increases on historic money printing, you begin doing price increases based on future money printing. <laughs> and, um, and so people, people get wise to the system. And, and so they start raising, raising their prices and the, the amount of money ends up not being enough in the, in, in the society. And, and this is where the, the, uh, the second gorge moment happens. The first gorge moment is when past inflation becomes future inflation. Uh, um, and 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 the second gorge moment is where the country experiences money shortages. Hmm. So the money printing actually leads the country into money shortages. And what people will say, ah, oh, there's like a banking, you know, there's shortages of money. We need to be printing more. There's there's a deflationary risk, and you know all of that sort of stuff. You would have heard it before, because that's the you know it's is you get this fundamental driver of money printing leading into this, uh, uh, this bizarre scenario of money shortages. Um, that then leads, uh, you know, the government then typically responds with money printing, more money printing to, to bail out the banks and uh, start supporting industry with, with uh, uh, newly printed money. And, um, and that then leads into the emptying of stores and the shutting down of industry, as we'd mentioned. It's another gorge moment. It's quite jolting. And, and very closely aligned to that is the, the moment where people stop lending money, okay? So capital markets basically shut down. Um, it, it, apart from the centralized government that's printing money and sort of 
pumping it into the system, very difficult to get any 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 uh, 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 capital uh, um, from from normal markets. You would be crazy to lend money to to, to people and get a, sort of a fixed interest rate uh, in in a uh, in a money printing world, because ultimately the value of your loan appreciates to nothing. Okay, so so that, that's the end of lend. That's the fourth uh, gorge moment. Then finally, people begin to abandon the the currency, and 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 it's it's what we call the flight to real value. So you begin trying to get rid of the currency and finding goods and services that you can buy that will just retain their value over time. And, and that leads into this, this bizarre uh, kind of time where, where, where everyone's spending, everyone's trying to spend, <laughs> but it actually is a full-scale economic collapse. And, and the government in that, st- in that moment typically, very typically, tries to force people to continue using the money. And you get these, this radical influence uh, I- increase in, in, in government control, legal tender control, to try and stop people from using uh, an alternative currency. And you, know, you, got, you have to use this currency. And there's only so, so, so long that the government can do that when, until the last gorge moment, which is when the currency finally collapses out of use. That is, that, is, that is one of the best descriptions I've ever heard anybody describe of what's coming in the world today. What advice would you have for people seeing what's happening with the US dollar, the reserve currency of the world, which is now in complete printing mode? They're pushing, they're, they're excitedly saying, we finally have inflation. They're, they're finally bragging about it. They know it's coming. And then it just goes on and on. So what would, you, what would you say to people who are young enough and astute enough and courageous enough to do something? <laughs> what advice would you have for them? Robert, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And it's the question that we, we get quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, you know, people you know, will have this conversation. It'll last for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. And people say, okay, okay, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Money printing is happening and hyperinflation is coming. You know, just t- tell me my quick wins. What must I do? Okay. <laughs> and, um, and the answer is there's no, there's no sort of easy solutions. You know, so I can give you a couple of kind of high level sort of tips. But ultimately what it requires is people to, um, to really soak in uh, these concepts, you know, the, the, the world of sound money and the environment where, where your, your currency and money, monetary system is, is, um, is stable and prices are stable. Like that's a different scenario to a world where, where prices are rising and people are getting impoverished. It's a, it's a completely different scenario. It requires an entirely different outlook on the world. Okay. So, so we, we typically say, look, you need to spend some time educating yourself. Understand it. There are several books that are amazing. On our website, we, we, um, we, we've got a sort of list of kind of easy reading, harder, you know, medium and kind of more, more complex. In terms of just educating yourself, understand what are the forces at play because this stuff is subtle. You don't see it until you've actually, uh, until it's actually like really taken away a lot of uh, value. I think next thing to say is what typically happens in, um, in, in, in any culture and every culture is that people typically move from a weak currency to a strong currency, wow. to a relatively sound currency. What we, what we saw in, in Zimbabwe was probably about a quarter, uh, 20 to 25%, maybe a, th- a third of Zimbabweans left Zimbabwe and they traveled. They typically traveled across the border to South Africa, to Botswana, Mozambique, all the countries surrounding. And then they went to kind of, uh, uh, you know, other countries. But, you know, in South Africa, relatively speaking, you know, South African currency has been weaker compared to the British pound or ca- uh, Canadian dollar. So all the South Africans have been going off to, to England to go in. Oh, uh, so what uh, happens is, is they follow the money. They migrate with the money. Sound money systems. 
you 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 know the, one of the foundations of freedom, your foundations of liberty, is sound money, and and so so what we what we what we typically recommend is you know look at a country that um, that has relatively you know relative uh, sound money system, and consider uh, uh, moving. You know it's it's that bad. That's you know that's how how intense it actually gets. Next thing is, you know, we talk about people moving from uh, weak currency systems to strong currency system. The same things happen. The same thing uh, happens with capital. So if you have your money in a weak currency system, and it's and it's uh, deflating, uh, 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 depreciating. Sorry, you typically take your money out of the depreciating currency and you put it into a stronger currency. So we had Zimbabweans taking all their money out of Zimbabwe, any money they could get out of Zimbabwe, and they put it in South Africa. Relatively speaking, South African uh, South African rand was was stronger than the Zimbabwe dollar. But you have South Africans saying, oh, "How do I get my money out of South Africa and put it into uh, you know?" Historically, it's been p- putting it into British pounds and US dollars and and, and euros. Uh, um, the problem is, is that America, England, the eurozone, Japan, China, all of these uh, 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 currency blocks, monetary regions. Have been printing money on a on an outrageous scale, trillions and trillions and trillions over the last year. So so it's not an easy thing, you know. Where 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 would you where, where would you uh, uh, put your money? You know, the, the the whole concept, and you and I have talked about this over the years as we've talked on various platforms. Uh, you know, we believe that that uh, the beauty of uh, of of the the cryptocurrency revolution. Is that it enables people to uh, create a sound money system where no one has the ability to print more money than it's been designed by the system. Okay, and and now there's a whole lot of other risks associated with uh, with cryptocurrency that you should familiar f- familiarize yourself with if you're going to get involved in it. But the 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 ideology of 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 Bitcoin and and uh, and these cryptocurrencies. Is ultimately that you can create a global reserve sound money system, okay? So, so certainly cryptocurrencies uh, 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 play a significant role in where we, where you would put your money, um, but they're not the golden, uh, they're not the silver bullet, because what happens when a go- when when you live in a country where the government is trying to force you to use the money that they're that they're printing, and and they begin to make it, they, they don't like competitors. And they start increasing transaction control, and start saying you can't use uh, uh, you know cryptocurrencies as an example. Okay, it's illegal. We're doing it for your benefit, but the real reason is because uh, that they they would try and shut it down is, is because um, it's becoming a competitive threat. Um, so so there's no easy answers to this, and and I, I you know I just come back to this 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 idea that. Uh, you know, you should educate yourself. You know, a very interesting story in Zimbabwe. The uh, government control initially was, you know, you have to use Zimbabwe dollars, and then they made it illegal that if you were caught with US dollars, because at the time US dollar was was relatively strong, if you were caught with US dollars, you were put in jail. And then they started to, you know, it became like radical. You know, people, you know, were trying to get these sort of Swiss bank accounts, and how could they keep their money offshore? And then, then the government made it illegal that if you were caught keeping your books of account in a foreign currency, they would put you in jail. Okay, because you, you know, people are just trying to benchmark. How do I benchmark what is my normal trade when prices are rising and I actually don't know whether I'm actually making a profit or loss? Okay, so then they try and keep their books of account in a, in a, in a stable currency. And the government was making it illegal to even use a uh, uh, Use a benchmark if they if they caught you. I mean, you, you could you you had, you had to do your accounting in Zim dollars. In Zim do, in Zimbabwe dollars, and the crazy thing is that you know obviously <laughs> prices are rising all the time, so people are always making a profit because you know you, know, you had this sort of small amount of money initially, and then now like prices have risen, but you don't know whether you've actually made a profit because the your buying power of that profit is actually reducing on an ongoing basis. Right. And um, and and one of the things I mean, an interesting scenario is that there, there were so many zeros on the currency ultimately <laughs> that that 
the accounting systems didn't have enough, enough zeros data enough like if uh, uh, digits in the fields <laughs> to be able to cope with the with, with the, the the prices that you know ultimately that people were paying well you know uh, Philip you're the best man you're absolutely the, you're the rock star of the day man I tell you you have you know I'm, I'm so glad you're part of capitalism manifesto number one and um, you know this, uh, what you're saying here is so priceless for the world to understand because as we're talking right now Janet Yellen who is our she used to be our Fed chairman and now she's the Secretary of Treasury and she's kind of rattling the saber sword <clears throat> saying that they're going to check into Bitcoin you know because we're, we're competition to their uh, Bitcoin's a competition or Ethereum or Coinbase or the, their, their competition to the central banks of the world's franchise of printed money. So I'm glad you're saying what you're saying. We're not saying it's the panacea, but it should be considered. Is that basically what you're saying? Yes. I mean, I, 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 it, it depends who you, who you speak to about cryptocurrencies, yeah. but, 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 but um, I, I, you know, we certainly see Bitcoin as a global reserve sound money instrument. And yeah. the network effect is growing and growing. You know, price increases, people see, you know, see the speculative uh, boom. But what they don't see is that the, the actual use of Bitcoin is growing around the world. People are yeah. actually using it to transact cross borders. Unit of exchange. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a currency that people are using. Right. right. Isn't that interesting? We're, exactly. He said something about it. we're smuggling hard currency out. Yes. Yeah. The government typically, you know, as as I as I mentioned, it's, it's it um, tries to stop people from um, from taking money out the country. It tries to stop people from investing and actually using relative sound, you know, you call it hard currency, we, we call it sound money, um, but things that you can use to actually benchmark day-to-day -day trade. Um, and so you get these huge amounts of uh, um, exchange control. Typically, the government starts to implement um, uh, you know, price caps. You know, like everyone's talking about this inflation. Oh, it's going to be a great thing. But I can tell you, as soon as it begins to affect ordinary cons uh, consumers, what's going to happen is, and this is what happens every time, yep. is the government's going to say, ah, it's these profiteers. Yep. And, they, and they're raising their prices unreasonably. And, uh, and then they, they, they put these price caps. So you're actually not allowed to uh, raise your prices and we start monitoring you. And that's, that, that, that uh, means that the government's actually got to come in and start regulating people's in individual engagements at the point of sale. So can I, can, I, can, I add one, can I add one more thing? Is that, so 2019 was a big year for me. So I'm coming out of Zimbabwe or Rhodesia into South Africa. And then, you know, I'm, I'm a rugby fanatic. And so I was in Tokyo for the uh, World Rugby Tour Cup. Oh, great. And, you know, like, uh, you know, South Africa is one of my favorite, favorite, the Springboks, one of my favorite teams, you know, and well, we hate you guys, but we love, we love the sport, you know. And <laughs> so I'm in, I'm in Japan cheering for, you know, just for the sport. I just love rugby union. And as I was coming into Japan, they weren't checking me for drugs. They wanted to know if I was carrying gold. Isn't that right. interesting? So, Philip, I want to I want to thank you very, very much. You're a rock star. I mean, I, I still remember the day I'm cruising through Johannesburg Airport and I see this book when money destroys nations. I said, "Well, who is this guy?" That was years ago, and that book just opened my eyes. And so, you have your message today is more important than ever before. So, you know, I, I thank you for being episode one of Capitalist Manifesto, and we're. Uh, it was exciting times. Thank you very much, my friend. You're a rock star. Thank you. <laughs>